uh, bon dia. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be speaking here at the, uh, uh, at the 15th anniversary of uh, the creation of Ubuntu. Uh, I've been a, a user for 14 of those 15 years. Um, uh, so, yeah, I've, I'm from Australia originally. Uh, I run a little hosting company called Gladserve in Scotland. Uh, and I live in France, uh, neither of those places, and uh, do a few things with, with multicast. Uh, so, before we begin, um, obviously I'm fairly comfortable with multicast, well you'd hope so, I'm giving this talk, uh, but I don't know whether everyone else here is. Um, I know one of our uh, video engineers has, has used it a little bit, but just to make you feel comfortable, I want to give you an option. We could do this talk um, in a unicast fashion. Uh, and if people would like to do that, um, just form a queue uh, up at the front of the stage here. Um, and I'll give you the talk one at a time, basically. Um, so if you come forward, um, it'll work a bit like this. Now we need right. to, this is TCP IP, so unicast, we need to perform a handshake, get a connection going there. And then we need to maintain that connection throughout the talk. Now, the talk is going to take about 45 minutes plus, plus questions. Um, so, obviously, you know, we're a lot cleverer than that in the unicast world. Um, I've got two arms. I could do two of you at once. Um, you know, obviously, the load on me, the speaker, goes up if I'm doing that because I need to deliver a few lines here and then deliver a few lines there. Now maybe a couple of you could attach to my legs, but that's about my limit. And again, the load's going up because I'm repeating a few lines here, I'm repeating a few lines there and to there and to there, and I'm, I seem to be doing some sort of dance. Now again, we can be a little bit cleverer than that. Uh, obviously in the unicast world, we have all sorts of hacks that we, uh, we put in place to make unicast work. So I could appoint a couple of you as proxies and I could deliver the talk to you, again, a few lines at a time. You could take a copy of my slides, record what I'm saying, and then pass that on to the people behind you. Um, it's not going to, you know, it'll speed things up a little bit, but it's still going to take quite a long time. Or, and I'm going to propose something crazy here, I could do this talk in a multicast fashion. Just introduce you to the idea. It'll be your first experience perhaps of multicast, but um, I think it would save a lot of time. And importantly for me, the speaker, um, the load is going to be a lot lower. So um, who's for unicast? Uh, right, we can try that later. And multicast? Very good. Um, okay, so essentially by coming to this room, you have in a sense, joined my multicast group. Thank you. There are other groups going on at the same time in other rooms. You could have chosen to go there, but you've, you've elected to perform a multicast join on my group by coming here. And the great thing about this is, I don't need to know whether any of you are here or not in a multicast world. I can present this talk, and I can present it to all of you at once simultaneously. And if somebody else comes into the room, the load on me, the speaker, does not change. I haven't noticed the extra person walking into, into the room. Uh, and if you all get up and leave, please don't, then the load on me doesn't change at all. Um, the only thing is, obviously, if you all leave the room, um, then the first hop router is going to drop all the traffic, so no data is going to be sent. Um, so, okay, having decided we're going to do this in a, a multicast fashion, uh, let's carry on. Uh, multicast, um, well, there was an RFC written about multicast in September 2001, so about 18 years ago. Uh, RFC 3170. IP multicast will play a prominent role on the internet in the coming years. It is a requirement, not an option, if the internet is going to scale. Multicast allows application developers to add more functionality without significantly impacting the network. And yet, here we are 18 years later, and multicast is not used much, certainly not on the internet. 
It's widely misunderstood, mostly ignored. It's just a bit too hard, really. Um, so I'm hoping in this talk to show you that multicast is uh, more efficient than unicast, that it's more scalable th than unicast, that it can be used to solve real-world problems, uh, that it has privacy implications, that it can help improve privacy, uh, that it is the missing piece in the decentralization puzzle, and it can help make this fellow a little bit happier at the same time. Uh, we'll go into that more later. So, what is multicast? Any of you worked with multicast? Hands up? Okay. Um, a few of you? Very good. Um, those of you who've uh, done a computer science degree um, or just looked at a, a textbook may have come across some sort of definition of, of multicast. You'll have seen, obviously, that there's unicast, which is one-to-one -one communication. The red node sends to the green node. We don't need to worry about the yellow nodes. And then we have broadcast. One node sends to all nodes. We don't tend to use that too much on the internet, thankfully. Uh, and it doesn't exist at all in IPv6. And then multicast, one node sending to multiple nodes. Right? That's more or less what we've been told. Well, that's not right. That's wrong. No form of IP multicast in use today does that. One node sending to multiple nodes. That suggests that the sender has any clue about the destination. In the case of unicast, it sets one destination. In the case of multicast, it sends to a group. It does not know about these green nodes here. There might be none. There might be a million of them. It just doesn't know. So even what we've been taught about multicast at a very basic level is, is wrong. It's at least misleading enough not to be useful. Um, there is a fundamental difference between unicast and broadcast and multicast. Anyone want to have a guess what that might be? Okay, well, uh, the key thing about unicast and broadcast is they are push. You send the data to a destination. In the case of multicast, you pull. It's pub-sub. Basically, the listening nodes need to join a multicast group, otherwise they don't receive any data. You can't spam over multicast. You can't force that information out there. So we come to this. If a tree falls in the forest and nobody is listening, is any data sent? And the answer in a multicast world is no. It gets dropped by the first hop router. Uh, or by the switch if it's using IGMP snooping or MLD snooping. Uh, so multicast has some really interesting properties when you start looking at it. There are a lot of misconceptions surrounding multicast. Uh, some of the ones I've heard are that it's only for streaming. It's certainly the most common usage of multicast. It's the obvious one. Uh, a lot of people use it on private networks and so on. Um, we worked with a um, uh, an audio company in Scotland uh, who are using IPV, IPv4 multicast and doing streaming across networks and configuring IGP, IGMP snooping on their switches and so on. The other uh, thing that I've heard is it's no use for video on demand. So you can do streaming as long as everyone wants to watch it once, but there's no point in doing multicast if you've got different people wanting to watch at different times. Uh, I've heard that it's unreliable because it's based on UDP. I've even, from the CTO of one European uh, open source company, heard that it's insecure because you can't do uh, an exchange of keys and so on. Um, it was particularly concerned about encryption, uh, but we have solutions for that. We can, we can do group encryption keys and so on. And the other one is that it can't work on the internet. Uh, so you'll be pleased to know they're all wrong. Um, we can fix all of that, um, but this is what's commonly believed. When I go to talk to people about multicast, this is what I hear. So, what is multicast then? If all of that's wrong, what is it about? Multicast is about group communication. 
And the funny thing there is that all communication is group communication. Uh, even if I'm just talking to one other person, that's just a very small group. It's a special case of multicast. And it's kind of the only case, that special case, where unicast makes sense. We're talking to multiple people, we've got multicast for that. It is by definition the most efficient way of communicating in groups. Whether it is in practice is a fault of the implementation. So, you are here. Well, not really quite there. You're sort of around that way a bit. But, uh, yeah, it's, we'll we take a shortcut and go the other way, can we? Okay, right, yeah, that, that'll do. Um, so there's something like seven billion people sharing this planet, and uh, that number seems to be going up rather than down. Many of those people are on the internet or want to be on the internet. Quite a lot of them, including probably most of the people in this room, have more than one device. So uh, on top of that, we've got the Internet of Things. Every fridge and washing machine and even different bits of the same car all want IP addresses and want to talk to each other. Um, so that's a whole lot of nodes that want to communicate. Um, so this might be, might be you over here. Uh, you might be talking amongst your friends uh, in a group. You might be talking amongst your family. You might be talking amongst your work colleagues. This, this is all group communication. Um, we won't worry about Uncle Bill over there. He's um, got some strong views on immigration, so we don't want to talk to him. And so, we come to the elephant in the room. Essentially, RFC 3170 that we were looking at um, says that multicast is necessary for the internet to scale. And I'm standing here saying that multicast is worthy of your attention. That it's not only useful, but necessary for the internet to continue to scale. And yet here we are 18 years after that RFC was written, a long time after multicast was first developed. We're not using it. So unicast must be working just fine. Why am I here? Why am I talking to you? Um, I think there is a problem with Unicast. Um, Unicast looks like it's working. We can all go and log on to our Facebooks and Mastodons and other things. We can send emails to each other and so on. And it, it gives the appearance that we have a functional internet. But um, the only way that's really worked is by using these, these hacks, these kludges I was talking about at the beginning, you know, setting up proxies, uh, content delivery networks and so on. The only way it's working is because of this, massive centralization. That's the only way Unicast is working. So the RFC was right that it was written before the likes of Facebook and others started to take our data and put it in places like this. Um, note the massive substation in the, the foreground there. Um, all of that cooling and so on. And this is one of Google's data centers in North America. And I think they're, they're planning to expand that quite a bit. I think they're having a bit of a fight with the local authority over water for the cooling and so on. It's, it's not doing a lot of good for that polar bear we saw earlier. Um, so unicast works, but only because of this. Uh, multicast lets us be a lot more efficient. We don't need this. There, there are cases where this, this is useful, but if we want to send data to groups of people, if you want to communicate amongst your Ubicon colleagues here, you don't need to send messages via a data center in the US or somewhere else and have that disseminated to all of those individually. You can send over multicast. You should be able to. So I argue that multicast leads to centralized designs. Multicast, sorry, unicast leads to centralized designs. Multicast allows us to keep those decentralized options open. We can still build a centralized system with multicast where it makes sense to do so, perhaps for a corporate environment where you want tight centralized control, uh, particularly if you're the CEO. Um, but we don't have to. We have all the options of talking individually to 
to whoever wants to be in the group. Um, so again, why does it matter? Um, we'll come to that. So why does any of this matter at all? Um, a part of it comes down to this, human rights. Uh, this is something that concerns me quite a lot. Human rights like the right to a private life, the right to privacy. Um, the other human right is, uh, is about democracy. Um, democracy is under threat. Um, the internet, I think, is the best tool for democracy that we've ever built. Um, it allows people to communicate and organize, to organize protests, or to just meet up with their friends, to disseminate information, for whistleblowers like Snowden to pass information around. You can't have a democracy without having an informed electorate. How can you go to the polls and make an intelligent decision about who to vote for if you don't have any information? Um, but unfortunately, that tool, that democratic tool of the internet is under threat. It's under threat from criminals. Um, it's under threat from uh, corporations, uh, many of those. It's, it's under threat from uh, governments as well, who want to censor and control the population. Corporations want to uh, control your information, centralize it, analyze it, feed you advertising. That's how uh, those massive data centers get paid for. Um, that's you paying for that. Uh, you think, oh, Google's paying for that. Well, where do they get the money from? They get the money by monetizing your data. So, uh, And governments want to shut down, control, censor. They break off bits of the internet when there are protests going on in certain places. Uh, Russia's done that recently. I think Uganda chopped a bit off. Uh, Iraq, uh, a week or so ago, chopped off a, a chunk of the internet due to uh, some unrest there. We don't tend to hear about that a lot, but it's a problem. Um, so, this is what happens when you don't resize your images. Or did I not click it hard enough? Hello? There we go. I didn't click it hard enough. Um, yeah, so the other reason it matters is this fellow. Um, those, those data centers are chew, chewing up a huge amount of electricity. Um, I mean, a data center, what is it? It's, it's a bunch of computers in one place generating heat. Uh, so that's not too good. That upsets the polar bears. It makes Greta Thunberg very angry. Um, and we need to do something about it. Well, if we can work in a more efficient manner with multicast, perhaps we should. The thing is, the internet, when it was first designed, when it was first built, when the first protocols were standardized, it was built in a different time. We had different design goals back then. I wouldn't say that security was not a priority, but it certainly wasn't as high a priority as it is now. Um, has anyone here uh, done any sysadmin on a server over Telnet? Um, it's, it's probably 20 years. I'm seeing a couple of nervous hands going up. No, don't be ashamed. They'd, we hadn't invented SSH back then. I remember telnetting from Australia to a server in the US to do some sysadmin. No encryption. Um, it was a friendlier time. Um, email with no encryption and you know no possibilities in there. DNS and all the fun problems that we're dealing with now and trying to patch over the top of DNSSEC and DNS over HTTPS and, and all this sort of thing. The design goals of today's internet, the internet that we need, is very different from the internet that we have. If we were to sit down and, you know, amongst us, build a new internet today, and we knew it was going to run at the scale it's going to run at, and scale billions, we had no idea. If we knew that security and privacy were going to be fundamental parts of that design goal, uh, would we choose a, an IP protocol that has a source and destination address on every packet? Is that a good starting point? There are IP protocols, there are other protocols that don't require this. It was done because it's convenient. Um, even the 
multicast that's in use today does not have a destination address on it. So we've already got a privacy improvement there from multicast, and we haven't done any work yet. Um, we can actually build a protocol that doesn't have a source or a destination address. Such things exist. Uh, so, how did we get here? Brief history of IT, IP multicast. Some of the early RFCs for multicast uh, talk about multicast in the way I'm talking uh, about it to you today. They talk about many-to-many -many group communication. They talk about the usefulness of this. And then the very first protocols that came out, the very first protocol RFCs that were standardized, came up with this. Protocol independent multicast. Um, essentially, the protocol independent bit means that as long as you've got some kind of unicast routing set up, then this can work. They don't care whether you're using OSPF or BGP or RIP or whatever to propagate your routes. PIM is, is built on top of that. So I, I like to call it unicast dependent multicast. It's the multicast you have, it's a, it's a lovely hack. It's a, a cheap way of getting multicast on top of a unicast internet. But unfortunately, it cripples it quite badly. Uh, so right from the get-go, right from the very first RFCs about multicast, we've, we've crippled the thing. We can do better than this. Uh, so on a LAN, multicast looks a bit like this. Um, in the case of IPv6, we've replaced uh, broadcast completely with multicast. Although if this switch hasn't got MLD snooping turned on, then it still just looks like broadcast. You send a multicast packet and it goes everywhere. You need to tell your switch to keep an eye on the group joins and leaves. And that's all it does. Keep an eye who's interested in a particular multicast group, keeps a, a, an interface list, um, and so when a packet gets sent, it sends it just to the ports that actually want it. Um, so that's on a LAN, but we're not going to get very far just with that. So what we need to do is have a little chat about multicast routing. Uh, which means we have these lovely things called rendezvous points, which sounds very romantic, doesn't it? C'est très romantique, non? Uh, it's, you didn't realize that that was hidden away in multicast. So, uh, rendezvous points. Um, the very first uh, protocol independent multicast was uh, a form of any source multicast, which means any of these nodes uh, could, be, could be sending. And so if you're over there at, say, Ubuntu 2, and you want to join a, a particular multicast group, and you don't know who the sender is, um, then you send a, a message to your switch, which goes off to your router there. And router 5 says, well, I don't know what to do with this. Um, so what we do is we configure a rendezvous point on the network. We tell all the routers somewhere to just kind of meet up in case somewhere, you know, someone wants to send some traffic. So basically we might, you should really put it in the middle of your network, but we could put it right up here at router four just to be silly. And so Ubuntu 2 sends its PIM join to uh, router five. And router five says, well, there aren't any active senders on this group, so I'll send it up here towards the rendezvous point. I'll send that up here. And what it does as it goes along is it keeps an outgoing interface list of nodes that are interested, or interfaces that have interested parties on there. So uh, Router5 knows that someone, doesn't know whether it's Ubuntu 2 or 3, it doesn't care, um, someone on this ETH02 interface is interested in a particular multicast group. So that's a star comma G PIM join. And then this adds E0 slash 1 to its outgoing interface list, and then it sends it on to router 4. It says, well, I haven't got any senders, so I'll just ignore it. And then say Ubuntu 1 over here wants to send something to a, a multicast group, then it sends it off to router 1, who says, well, I don't know who's listening. Uh, that sends it off to router 2, sends it off to the rendezvous point, router 4, and now we've got a source and a listener, we can actually build our source tree. I'm not going to go into the technical details of that. It's complicated. There are multiple different modes. In IPv4 land, you've got sparse and dense mode. In IPv6, you've just got sparse mode. 
uh, but there's bi-directional multicast and various other kinds. Um, so essentially, uh, we can now build a source tree that is the most direct route for this sender to send to the listeners over there. Um, if Ubuntu 3 joins in and wants to listen to the same group, then it'll send the same message, message to Router 5. Router 5 will say, well, I've already got that in my ad outgoing interface list, so I don't need to do anything. So this node is just sending one stream of data, and it's getting split into two at that switch. Um, that's a lot more efficient than sending two streams of data. This node doesn't even know who's listening. So that's star comma G. That's any source sending to that group G, any source multicast. Uh, along came um, a little hack, another one to, to make things a little bit easier, which is single source multicast, which is where we skip that whole rendezvous point, point thing, and we say, I know where the source is. I am going to join that group at that source. So I'll send a PIM join uh, with the source address in there, and I can go straight to building the the source, uh, the source tree. Um, this is good for one-to-many situations. It's not good for many-to-many. -many. So uh, it limits what we can do. IPv6 has a lot of improvements over IPv4 in terms of multicast, um, not the least of which is that uh, there's a much bigger space for groups available with IPv6 uh, multicast. You've got 2 to 112 bits of group address space, which is enough to allocate a group for every atom on Earth, and then some. Uh, so that lets us do all sorts of cool things, which we can get to in a bit. Um, I'm not the first person who's, who's thought of trying to use multicast on the internet. Back in the early 90s, they came up with a thing called mbone. Um, it was essentially a method of tunneling your bit of multicast internet into a backbone where others are using uh, multicast. It required sort of specialized hardware and software, but it, it got to all continents on Earth. Uh, I think Rod Stewart famously gave a concert over it. It's like, to everyone out there in the Ambon, uh, hello. Um, at the Vrije Universiteit in Brussels, uh, they come up with a thing called Castgate. That's been defunct for more than 10 years now. Uh, I think that was a browser plugin and some other bits and pieces, again, to connect back to a centralized backbone. It was mainly concerned with streaming and so on, as most things with multicast are. This is quite recent. This is only a few years old, but it's automatic multicast tunneling. There's an RFC for it. I forget the number. But um, this is of no use to you here because what that does is tunneling, but it lets you tunnel from your Cisco or Juniper router uh, to other routers with other um, ASM numbers, other you know, top level providers. You can connect your network with their network, um, and it's a handy little tool for doing that. But if you wanna write an application uh, that supports multicast, you don't have control, you might have control of your local router, but you don't have control of the routers of every user of your software or potential user. So this isn't going to solve our problem. So TCP IP. We like TCP IP. It does all sorts of fun things for us. It's unicast, obviously, but it lets us layer a reliable network on top of a connectionless, unreliable um, uh, underlying uh, system. Uh, but it's got a lot of problems. It's kind of coming apart at the seams in a couple of ways. Um, I'll try and cover a bit more of that later. Uh, there are things like latency and so on. We're, we're moving away from TCP IP, uh, much to my surprise and delight. But multicast is built on top of UDP, so we don't have those TCP features. So if we send a packet, we don't know if it's going to turn up. Uh, it might not arrive, it might arrive out of order. And that's bad for some types of applications. It's not bad for streaming, because frankly, if a packet's late, there's no point sending it later. We don't want, you know, if, if there's some packets from earlier in my talk, you don't want to hear what I said, you know, five minutes ago now. It interrupts the audio, it interrupts the video. Uh, so it was why we tend to do streaming over UDP. Um, 
So are there in the multicast world any other ways we can achieve TCP IP-like reliability? And the answer is yes, we can. There's even an RFC for some of them. PGM, uh, Pragmatic General Multicast, RFC 3208. It's experimental. And I'd say the reason it's experimental is because it's, it's not really an RFC you just go and implement. It's more, it's a very long RFC, it's very long and complicated, and it's more a, a set of ideas. It's a toolkit of things you can do. Um, some of the things you can do um, is you can send NACs. Obviously in a unicast world, we send a bit of data and we get an ACK back. And then I, the sender, am responsible for that uh, flow control for that, for making sure that data gets through. If I don't get an ACK back after a couple of packets, I send the data again. Uh, in a multicast world where I might be talking to a million nodes, I don't really want to get ACKs back. Uh, I don't really want to keep track of a million nodes. Um, so what we do instead is we say, you, the listeners, are responsible for your own receipt of data. Um, you keep track of what you've received. We can put sequence numbers on the packets, for example. So I send you packet one, and two, and three, and five, and you go, oh, what happened to four? And then you can send back a knack for packet four, and then I'll repeat that bit of the talk. And I'll say, OK, this is what I said a moment ago. Um, now, again, on an unreliable network, that might, that might DOS me. Um, so the thing is that you don't need to send that knack necessarily to the source. You could send that to one of your neighbors. You just lean over and say, did you hear what he said? Ah, yeah, OK, cool. Um, you can do that quite unobtrusively. I don't even need to know what's going on. So you can have logging nodes and so on. There are different ways you can do this. Uh, so that's, that's the replay. Um, in certain circumstances, as I'll demonstrate later, simply looping and repeating the data can work. Depends what you're doing. Uh, and then there's this. I love this. That's Voyager 1. Um, that was sent off into space back in the 70s. And TCP IP has, has some problems. As I mentioned, it doesn't really work very well in high latency environments. It doesn't really even work very well over satellite, um, as I can tell you from my farmhouse in France. Um, you know, there's all sorts of accelerated technologies that they put in place with satellite uh, communication, such as not bothering to wait for the axe to come back. Well, that breaks a lot of things, VPNs and so on. Um, FEC is forwards error correction. It's a type of ECC error correction. Um, Voyager 1 is running it. Uh, it's, it's great for space probes or unreliable uh, networks. Essentially, you're encoding a little bit of data into each packet, a little bit of redundant data into each packet. So if you miss packet 4, but you've got packets 1, 2, 3, and 5, then you can reconstruct packet 4. Now, obviously, there's a little bit of an overhead to doing so, and you've got to decide based on your application, your use case, what's the best way of, of um, you know, how much data to, to encode. But uh, it's very effective. So, multicast applications. Chat. That's a many-to-many -many application, isn't it? There's not much point just talking to one other person. Well, you can talk to one other person, but uh, there's not much point talking to yourself. Um, and you're likely to be talking to many people. Email. Well, can we just put one address in a 2 or a CC? No, we can put many addresses in there. This is a one-to-many application. Facebook and all social media is group communication, many-to-many. -many. File sharing, we generally want to share that with more than one, one other node. But at the moment, these are all built on top of Unicast. So we're doing multicast emulation, but we're doing it up here. We can do multicast all the way down here at layer three. It's a lot more efficient. We let the router take care of all that nonsense. You know, we have to build a lot of extra code to manage this multicast um, state. So I will come back to that in a little bit. So um, multicast party tricks, fun things we can do with multicast. Radio. Video streaming. Well, that's not a very fun thing to do with multicast. That's the boring thing that we always do with multicast. So let's skip that. Video conferencing is a bit more fun because that's many to many. 
Um, if you think about WebRTC, for example, if I want to set up a video conference uh, with so, uh, another party, then on my little home ADSL link in the middle of nowhere, I've got one up uh, stream and one downstream, and so has the other party. Uh, but uh, so I'm, I'm sending and I'm receiving. Um, but if I want to add in another node and we want to have a three-way video conference, then I've got an up and a down going to a node over here. I've got an up and a down going over there. So I'm, I've now got four streams trying to go in and out of my little ADSL connection. Um, fiber is coming soon, we are told. So, uh, and then we add in some more. And it, you can see it gets ridiculous very, very quickly. Uh, now, obviously, with WebRCC, those of you who are familiar with it, we... Uh, we can use a, uh, we need to use a signaling server anyway to set up the original connection, and we can use a stun server to set that up. Um, but that's not going to solve the problem because all that does is deal with the NAT, and then we're still sending directly because this is WebRTC, that's the point. Um, so sometimes you'll use a turn server, but that means all of the streams are going through that turn server, which means you're not really going peer to peer anymore, which loses a lot of the point of WebRTC. There's another problem with WebRTC too. It's built on top of UDP, which is fabulous. And so I got very excited and went off and read the RFC. I went, oh, they mandated encryption at the time they wrote the, the protocol. So I can see there's lots of good reasons for wanting encryption to be in the protocol, but generally we separate that out. And one of the reasons we separate that out is because we don't know all of the possible applications for that protocol. And in this case, nobody was thinking about multicast. If it's UDP, it could do multicast, but because of the specific type of one-to-one -one encryption that it mandates, it's broken for multicast. I think we could fix that. Replication, obviously, if you are running a primary server uh, and you want to replicate that data to some other servers, then uh, replication is how you do that. Now, your primary server is doing big, important things, uh, so it doesn't really make much sense for it to keep track of the state of the... Sorry, we're not allowed to use the word slaves anymore. The secondaries. Um, so that's, that can be dealt with quite effectively with multicast. Uh, the, the replicas, the, the secondaries... It'll take me a while to get that... Um, are, are responsible for looking after their own data receipt. Consensus, uh, pretty much the same as, as replication. Uh, if you need a bunch of nodes to agree on uh, a data value with Paxis or Raft, then multicast can help you. DNS, oh, this is a fun one. I like this. Um, anyone want to volunteer to tell me what the purpose of DNS is? Please. Correct. It's essentially taking a human readable name like example.com, hence domain name service, and it's turning it into a computer readable address. Well, you know, there's lots of good reasons that we have that. We don't want to be typing IP addresses in uh, when we want to connect to a website, do we? But the thing with multicast is we can throw DNS away completely. So this is what an IPv6 multicast address is. We don't care about IPv4 anymore. Forget it. We don't do it anymore. Um, so the first eight bits are all set to one. Uh, convert that to hex, and you've got FF. Um, I hope you're all familiar with IPv6. If not, see me after, and I'll talk to you about it at length. Um, and then we have uh, four bits for flags, uh, which basically determine, is the rendezvous point I mentioned earlier encoded in the address, the group address somewhere? Is, uh, is the prefix for the network, for the source encoded in there? And is this a permanent IANA allocated address or is this a temporary address? So it's probably a one in our case because that's going to be a temporary address. And then we have another four bits which indicate the scope of the multicast group. And uh, E is global and one is link local. So link local is never going to leave your local segment. Global can go anywhere. Now, we've got other ways of restricting with TTLs, time to lives, and 
Um, it, we can set uh, a domain on the packet as well uh, when we send it, but this is, this is how we do it in the group. And then out of our 128 bits of IPv6, we've got all of it left, 112 bits for the group address. Now, can anyone think of a way of doing uh, domain resolution with that? We've got 112 bits to play with. So you want to resolve example.com. We all just need to agree on where example.com is. So imagine you took a SHA-3 hash of example.com. Squeeze out 112 bits of it, tack an FF1E on the front of it, and you've now just resolved your human readable address to your computer readable address. No DNS servers in sight. Now that's a very simplistic example, but however we do it, it's going to be a very short RFC, isn't it? Uh, this, is, this is going to be one of the shortest RFCs ever written. Um, so we can do this, and I've been doing this for, for various applications, it's quite fun. Um, you know, in the case of SSM, you might have a use case for DNS, but the point is you don't need it. We can all individually resolve our addresses ourselves. Uh, so chat, okay, um, how am I doing for time? Got a little bit. Um, we, uh, here's the thing I built, I need to speed up a little bit though. So imagine we have a chat server. Chat's become very fashionable with uh, chat ops and so on. So we've got a very simple HTTP daemon sitting here, just a forking HTTP daemon, a bit like Apache, but very simple. Built using the LibreCast libraries, which is, well, it's my project for enabling multicast. And imagine that that uh, server, which is just listening for connections as, as normal here on its external interface, imagine it had a virtual tap interface down here that was plugged into a virtual bridge. So all this bit here is happening in memory inside the Linux kernel. It's all very fast, very efficient. There's no hardware device involved there at all. Um, and we talk multicast to it. It's a bit crazy because we are talking multicast to ourselves. Um, this is really the the only one-to-one -one case for multicast I've come up with. Well, one-to-yourself case for multicast. It's, but um, I was I was bored. Um, so imagine you have a, a client connect in. Now it connects in as normal over um, uh, over HTTPS. Upgrades that to a WebSocket. Downloads some HTTP, CSS, and a couple of bits of JavaScript. Little chat application here in JavaScript, and a little LibreCast library that just kind of mirrors the function of the, the library down here. So, yeah, we're now connected to a chat server, but it's not very fun just to chat to ourselves, so let's get some other people in here. And as I mentioned, it's a forking uh, web server, so we've now got a separate process handling each of these connections, and they're all connected to this bridge, and they're all talking multicast. So the only bit of this that knows that there's any kind of chat going on is this little bit of JavaScript up the top here. Um, this doesn't know about it, this doesn't know about it, and this is just sending IPv6 multicast. So we can chat, and um, if this node wants to talk to that node, they can join the hash ubicon channel, and we can resolve that group just the way I mentioned. Uh, just take a hash, and that all works very nicely. Um, but what if we then plugged that virtual bridge into an actual interface? And then we did this. I go, okay, well, let's, let's have an app. We can have a GitHub webhook over there as well, or GitLab if you prefer. Um, and they're all getting the chat as well. So we could actually, though, replace that with an entire other server. And what we've just done there is do clustering, or federation is perhaps a better word, for free. We haven't written a single line of code and we've got federation. So if you've got this server over here in Lisbon, that server over there in Tokyo, then, you know, we're here, we're chatting away about Ubicon. If somebody in Tokyo wants to join the Ubicon channel, they can, and the, the data will traverse across there and go to just the participant over there. We can have, obviously, many other uh, servers. Um, but if, if the Tokyo boys are over there and they just want to talk amongst themselves, we, none, none of the Tokyo data will ever come back across here. 
and the amount of code we've written, the amount of intelligence we've built in there, there's zero lines of code. Multicast just does it. It will send it to where it needs to go. If nobody here has joined a group that's over there, we don't need to manage anything. We don't need to manage users, we don't need to manage groups, and we don't need to manage um, the, the federation. In the case of, yeah? Am I? Okay, I'll wrap up. Um, okay, very quick ra rattle through the last ones. This is the last one. I built a little IoT updater. The server is 90 source lines of code, um, just written in C, and it uses multicast to send a file. So imagine you've got a billion IoT nodes out there, a billion, billion phones like this, and they all need a firmware update. Well, they can join a multicast channel based on their firmware, you know, they find their firmware revision, their model number, take a hash of that, join that group over single source multicast, which means there's only one setting that needs to be turned on on intervening routers, and the server just sends the file on a loop. And it doesn't matter when the device joins in, it just starts downloading from the middle, that's fine. It just keeps downloading to the end and then gets the beginning of it again. So each packet uh, has the offset and has a checksum for the data, and when the checksum matches, we stop downloading, we've got our update. And we've just, with one server, 90 lines of code, updated a billion nodes, and that server can have a firewall that's completely closed to inbound traffic. It only needs to send outbound UDP. The load on that server does not change whether there's nobody listening or whether there's a billion nodes listening. Sorry, but Unicast can't do that. Multicast can, it can do it right now with what's in routers on the internet. Every Cisco and Juniper out there supports IPv6 multicast. There's one setting that needs turn on, turned on to make that work. If you control the network end to end, turn it on, you're good to go. Billion nodes, one tiny little virtual machine. So, skipping through the rest, NTP, I'll skip over that. WebRTC we covered. This is exciting for me. TCP IP, I thought it was going to be the big blocker for multicast, and yet WebRTC is running on UDP. QUIC is built on top of UDP as well. So that means we could do multicast on the web. I'm not the only one who thought of this. I went and had a bit of a look, and BBC Research in the UK are in the process of standardizing an RFC to do exactly that. Uh, multicast HTTP3. Uh, well, the QIC bit, anyway, so that they can stream their videos out. Very excited to see where that goes. Syslog, channel per debug, per, you know, information level and so on. Any of your servers can join in and just get the bit of information you want. You want to do a debug session, just subscribe to that channel. If nobody's listening, no data is sent. So, I started the Librecast project to do this, bring multicast to the internet. Uh, how are we going to do it? Well, I'm trying to get multicast to in the hands of developers, uh, building a multi-messaging library, building a transitional tunneling technology on that so we can use it on the internet today, just like the mBone did. Um, we're working next on an improved routing protocol to try and get rid of those pesky source and destination addresses. And then the aim is to work with FOSS projects to try and enable multicast everywhere that we can, just as we've been doing with IPv6 before it and to ensure that any new standards that are coming out consider multicast, or at least don't exclude it in the way that WebRTC has done. So, I don't think we've got much time for questions, um, so you might have... Okay, well those are my contact details, and uh, we'll take a couple of questions, but yeah, anyone else who doesn't, you know, has a question, do come and find me afterwards. I like beer, buy me beer, Ask me about multicast, I'll talk for hours. Um, I have a question, yeah. Okay. So, is it working? I don't think yeah, so. It's good if you All right. Shout and I'll repeat the question. <laughs> so, the thing is, uh, you said that HTTP doesn't do multicast. Uh, so, what about the WebSocket protocol, especially when you, uh, like when you use protocols, like sub-protocols like WAMP, which introduces routed RPC and PubSub. Uh, so I actually work for the company that 
creates the protocol. Yeah. Uh, well, funds the protocol. Is I work for Crossbar. Yeah. So Crossbar is one of those things that actually enables you to do exactly what you are trying to say. Even though it's not on the hardware level, it's on the software level. Uh, you just enable RPC and PubSub uh, on the network. So uh, have you have you investigated on that one? I haven't, but I think I need to come and find you and have a chat about how that's working. I'm yes. interested to find out more. Um, sure. Yeah, with with um, WebSockets, you've got the ability to define a protocol for that chat server. I defined a, a LibreCast protocol. Uh, it's got nothing to do with chat. It's just about sending group messages. Any other questions before we take it to the corridor? Yeah? Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, uh, is the group centralized on these rendezvous nodes, or is it By more default, decentralized? Yes. I mean, there are methods for, it's, it's one of the problems with the uh, protocol independent multicast. It's very much depends on unicast, and it has these centralized rendezvous points, which are a single point of failure. There are methods for setting up using anycast and having failover between them. And this, this is a great example of how broken the multicast world is at the moment. You've got, um, oh, what's the name of the protocol? Um, there, there is a method in any case for communicating between uh, two rendezvous points or more rendezvous points and uh, syncing up your state and the individual nodes determine which one to connect to via any cast. So you don't have a single point of failure. But despite that becoming the de facto standard in the IPv4 world, the developers decided not to proceed with standardizing it, so it didn't become a standard. It's been abandoned now since about, I don't know, 2003 or something. And they specifically excluded support for IPv6. Um, the, the idea is in IPv6, well, we can encode the rendezvous point in the group address. That's one of the options you can do. But it reduces your address space and means we can't do fun DNS tricks. Um, there's a uh, single source multicast. So if you're sending one to many, then uh, they figure, well, that sort of deals with it. You don't need rendezvous points anyway. But for many to many to use the real power of multicast, we need many to many. Uh, and so we need to solve that rendezvous point problem. And that's part of what we're trying to do in the LibreCast project. Great. Thank you. Nice. So use multicast. Come and Talk to me about it, and uh, we'll revolutionize the internet and make those polar bears and Greta Thunberg a lot happier at the same time.